All right, are we ready to go here? How is everyone today? Great. Awesome. Um, I'd like to introduce you to today's panel moderator, Laura Miller. Laura is a newly named small business executive uh, for Commerce Solutions. Laura joined Chase in 2009 and recently served as the president of Chase Inc., um, Chase's small business credit card. She has become known throughout the industry for her thought leadership and adv advocacy for small business. Welcome, Laura Miller. Thanks, Michael. So good evening, and it's very exciting to be here, and um, thank you all for showing up. You know, we always get a lot of people that RSVP, and um, you, you know, as you know, in any party, there's always people who don't show up at the end, but kudos to all of you for making the commitment to be here, uh, because that's what can make the difference um, between success and not. So thank you very, very much. I'm really excited personally to be here at Dallas Startup Week. This is um, my second year in a row, and Chase for Business is very proud to be the sponsor of today's session. And our goal today is to demystify the credit process and equip you with actionable steps on how to use credit to capitalize on emerging opportunities or deal with unexpected surprises in your business. So with me today, I have a thriving entrepreneur and four small business thought leaders. So I'd like to um, have them introduce themselves so you can learn a little bit more about each of them. And I know why they are excited also to be here at Dallas Startup Week. So, Shelly, can I start with you at the end? Sure. Hi, I'm Shelly Whittem, and I am the director at Addison Treehouse. We're a co-working space up in Addison, Texas. And this is my first time at Startup Week. I'm really excited to be here, meet all of these awesome people, um, gain knowledge from everyone, and just bounce ideas back and forth, and uh, help you, and have y'all help me back and forth, and excited to be here. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Frank Madrano. I'm with J.P. Morgan Chase, and I lead our technology banking efforts for North Texas um, and the surrounding states. And we work with a range of companies, from uh, those that have already accessed the public markets to uh, earlier stage companies, in some cases pre-revenue companies that we've worked with, and advise as to capital formation and, and a number of other topics that we can get into a little bit later. Right, thank you. Hayden? Hi, Hayden Blackburn. I'm the director of IdeaWorks over in Fort Worth. So I'm from the west side of the Metroplex. Uh, excited to be over here. We work with mixed industries and uh, looking at the revenue generating companies that are looking to scale and grow their enterprises. And as well, I am also an organizer for One Million Cups Fort Worth. Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Meadows, um, an entrepreneur. We bought a business in 2008 at the height of the recession ended up evolving and evolving and now we have four small businesses, um, the latest being Nikki's Popcorn Company, which we started almost two years ago. So I'm excited to be here. Okay. Our thriving entrepreneur. <laughs> and Herb. Hey, good afternoon again. I am Herb Austin. I am the district director of the SBA office in Dallas Fort Worth covering 72 counties of Northeast Texas and serving about 860,000 small businesses, of which you are all part of here. Well, I'm happy to be here for two reasons, to see the small business customers that we like to work with, and we want to be able to talk to you about other programs that we have, even though today we'll be talking about lending. But I'm also here because if Chase tells me to be here, I need to be here. So I had no choice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we are, I'm going to have a series of questions for the panelists, and hopefully this is a really good conversation that you can take away some um, great nuggets of information and actions. Um, we will be having a reception immediately following across the hall. So we will have hopefully some time for questions after. But if we don't, please feel free to save them. And our lovely panelists will be joining us across the hall so that you can ask your questions and have any informal discussions and advice. So with that, let's get started. And Shelly, I'm going to go all the way to the end there and start again with you. So when starting your business, what advice do you have on how individuals can help to establish their business as a separate legal entity? Sure. 
Uh, so establishing a legal foundation is extremely important when starting a business and you want to make sure that you're doing it right the first time. Um, there's no room for mistakes and there's a lot of resources that are available to you to help you make those decisions and um, I'm going to mention a few good ones and some bad ones. I'm going to start with the bad example because I like to end on a good note. Uh, the first example of a bad one is LegalZoom. LegalZoom is an online resource that gives you free legal documents and it's not a good resource for you to use. There's mistakes in all of these documents all the time but you don't catch it until it's too late when you're, uh, you know, when, when someone's reviewing your document for a purpose, like if you and your co-founder are splitting up and you know, those types of mistakes, you don't have time for those mistakes later on. You have to make sure that initially everything is right from the beginning. So uh, the resources that I like to offer to people that I speak with are, um, a few, so Vila Wood is a law firm that specializes in startups and they're excellent um, and they're able to help you get off the ground, get running, answer those questions and uh, get you the information that you need to help you um, establish that legal foundation. Um, another really good example is uh, Legal Shield. Legal Shield is an, uh, a membership that you can have and you get basically free advice from a lawyer on call 24-7, any type of information that you may need. So if you're having a question, if you need them to review a document, um, any sort of legal advice that you may have, so that's a really good resource for you to have as well if you're trying to establish that foundation. Um, and then a third resource that I like to talk about is actually a mentorship program at the Treehouse where I work. Uh, we have two lawyers who are on our um, mentorship program. It's called Whiteboard Session and they come in twice a month and basically give out free legal advice and that you never get that. So that's a really good uh, opportunity for you to come and ask them the questions that you need, get the feedback that you need um, when you are starting a business. So I'm going to add on to that. Any sure. particular documents people be, should pre be prepared with um, before they go speak with, with um, you know, legal advice or a lawyer? Um, I mean, any sort of document that you have when you're starting your business, I would definitely bring with you to meet with your lawyers so that they can review it for you and give you the information that you need. Um, contracts, forms, documents, anything uh, that might need a signature for review, anything like that. Great. Hayden or Nikki, do you want to add anything? I saw you both nodding your head. and. <laughs> well, a large part of that is just knowing the assets that you need to collect. I mean, once you've made a decision on what legal structure you want to go with, whether it be S Corp, C Corp, LLC, I mean, you're really reaching out to the uh, Secretary of State to get an EIN, um, so you can really start to, to work on some of those documents and, and start to build uh, as a legal entity that is separate than your personal identity. The only thing I could add is just making sure that as soon as possible, separating your, like you mentioned, separating your personal and business finances, establishing a checking account and all that, and just keeping it separate because it makes it so much easier as you grow to keep those, to keep that separate. It's not muddied. Yeah. You know where you stand. And hang on to that thought because we're going to get back a little bit deeper dive into that as we go forward. So Frank. Yes. So again, so many things happening when starting a business. We just talked a little bit about the legal steps. Any advice on how to start to begin to build a credit history for business? Yep, absolutely. So in terms of kind of developing that autonomous identity of, of the company, it really is important, as mentioned earlier, to kind of carve out the funding and keep that entirely separate and arm's length from personal uh, from your personal matters, whether it's your personal investments in other entities uh, or from your personal liabilities and try to not, kind of, quote, cross-contaminate. Um, if you will, uh, to the extent that anybody's ever investigating, um, you know, the financials or the business in and of itself, you really got to be able to demonstrate that early on that was established as a, as a separate entity. Um, and work, work, of course, with, with you know, great advisors, uh, whether it be from a legal or an accounting perspective around that. Now, in terms of kind of raising capital uh, for this, this independent company, it's really helpful to have a plan, and, and I know we hear that very often whether we're listening to podcasts or reading other literature around kind of formation of a business, but it really is important to try and document um, a, a separate entity altogether, capitalize it separately, and speak to, uh, speak to potential investors, uh, banks, any, anybody else that may be interested in your story as if that's a separate entity and you're, you're speaking to it as if it's not necessarily your personal pet project, 
but truly is a, an independent entity. So um, the, the more that you establish that, um, that, that separation of responsibilities, the better off you'll be in the long run, not only in terms of kind of the ability to, to, to raise capital, uh, but also be able to defend why that's a totally separate entity that you may not be personally liable for. So you touched a little bit on the business credit mm -hmm. and personal credit. Um, Hayden, I'm going to ask you, you know, what is the biggest difference between the two in your experience and where can businesses go to monitor their business credit and should they? Business credit uh, is evaluated way more rigorously than personal for sure, so that's a big difference. Um, outside of just the scale of one to zero instead of uh, 800 or 850 and stuff like that. Um, but the, the difference is really that it can be impacted by a lot of different things. I mean, it, your business credit score can be impacted by board appointments, a change in the number of your board members and who's on there, um, those type of things, not just slow payments as that are most known. Um, so you want to know what your credit score is and how it impacts the ability to work with customers, the, the relationships with your vendors and financial institutions of how they're evaluating and what that means to you because sometimes a vendor you might go with doesn't report to the big bureau, Duns and Bradstreet, and so that's not getting captured in your credit, so you're not building a credit with that, so you wanna make sure the vendors that you're working with allow you to build um, credit within your business as well and to keep that kind of growing. Um, but there's three big credit bureaus, uh, your DNB, Duns and Bradstreet, uh, Equifax and Experian all kind of have business um, divisions that really report on those things. So those are your big credit bureaus. Um, there's lots of tools in the modern age that you can do for tracking it and getting kind of almost instantaneous kind of alerts about what's happening with that, uh, that number as it's changing. Um, and so with knowing how much it, it can impact uh, your relationships, I think it's really important to look at it almost monthly, just as you would with your financial numbers. Um, if you're doing reconciliation, pull up that credit score, know what you're really sitting at because it can change day to day as the company grows and the corporation grows as, a, as an entity um, outside of yourself. And so as an owner and operator, you really need to see where it sits um, so you can really work with that. Um, but also knowing that that's how you're evaluated. Um, I mean, that FICO score is very important to the, the financial institutions. And so um, you knowing what your business uh, credit uh, numbers are really important. Can I ask a question related to that? Of course. <laughs> it's a conversation. So when does, when does having your personal finances, it seems like when we first got into this, everything was based on our personal finances. At what point does that shift? Even if you've established business accounts and all that, right. we're still, our personal yep. stuff is still getting looked at. And absolutely. So that's not necessarily a, a precise date. I hate to say, but of course, it always <laughs> depends on the underlying circumstances. Uh, but to the extent that the company has you know, demonstrated its ability to generate any form of revenue, uh, not necessarily profits, profits of course are always helpful, but the ability to generate revenue and uh, kind of self-sustain itself as an autonomous entity, it's helpful. Um, unfortunately, it really is industry by industry, uh, company by company where that transition occurs. Um, as you may have experienced firsthand, in some cases it's an evolutionary process where the, the company's ability to, to garner credit or capital is uh, contingent upon kind of the personal recourse, right? In some cases, that burns off over time. Uh, some institutions, it burns off um, at immediately upon the consummation of a certain transaction. In other cases, it burns off 80%, 50%, et cetera. Uh, but, but unfortunately, there's, there's just not a perfect answer no, around that. Yeah. Yeah. But Frank, are there signals? So is mm -hmm. there a signals where, you know, the the sure. liability structure or assets, you sure. know, personal or the business has built up enough assets to. Absolutely. Are there certain like triggers? Absolutely. There, there, there are, are capital measures um, where, where banks will kind of stress test no different than we ourselves are stress tests uh, of a company to be able to absorb certain shocks. So does it have access to alternative forms of financing? Does it have certain amounts of liquidity available to garner a, a, a downturn in the business by 20, 30, 50, whatever percentage for an extended period of time? If that's the case and it has the ability to do that, then by all means there's a case to be made that you know what this, this company is able to stand on its own two legs and it doesn't necessarily uh, need the, the personal financing or the personal financial support of, of the owners because again that access to alternative forms of capital because when companies can do that very often there are other investors that would come in and, and help bolster that company to the next round until it's able to pivot to 
uh, to a different stance. So in addition to making, obviously you're focusing on making a business profitable, these are things that should be Absolutely. in the back of your mind that Absolutely. you need to be graduating mm -hmm. away from that. Yep. And there's lots of assets. I mean, as Shelley mentioned, there's lots of information out there, um, not only including, you know, the typical bank or, or lenders, but we have many assets out there, like what Shelley's doing or today, that you can ask those questions to see when that time is and have people help you look at your business and understand when that shift could be occurring. Well, and one big thing too with personal credit, it's not really a good or a trustworthy indicator of business behavior. So it really is, mm -hmm. what is my business doing versus my personal? Yeah. So Herb, your turn. <laughs> so how can the attendees in our, in our audience better understand business credit options while they're building their credit? Sure. Um, I think one should ask oneself, if you are in the process of looking for financing, you should ask yourself three questions. What do I need the money for? What is my credit score, my FICO score look like so that I make sure I can get the credit that I need? And what do I need and how long can I repay that debt? So once you, you make that decision, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm now offering some, some perspective very quickly, if the money that you need is for working capital, long-term repayment, the best there is in the market is an SBA back loan, where we make a loan up to $5 million, and the bank makes the loan. We simply provide a guarantee to the loan, so they feel very comfortable making that loan. Interest rate, about 5.5%. Repayment, about 10 years, max. Now, if you're looking for a short, short-term loan, you're in business, you, you need to purchase uh, inventory, you need to purchase supplies or whatever the business, I would go to online. They have a lot of online services. The interest rate looks very high, but if it's a short term, repayable in 30 days, 60 days, you may end up paying three, four, five percent maximum. If you are already in business and you, you, you have a, a cash flow gap because you, you, you stock with a bunch of it, uh, receivables, you can use factoring. You can discount the receivables. Again, if it's long term, it's gonna cost you a lot of money, 30 to 50%. But if it's on a monthly basis, and you can, you do a 30 days, 60 days discount of receivables, you may end up paying three to 4% only. If you're looking for a line of credit, I would think of, of credit card, business credit cards. Again, it's very high interest rate. Maybe the lowest would be 13%, but nevertheless, for that purpose, it would be perfect for you. If I was a, a, a company in the startup stage, and I, I, my credit is not so good, I'm looking for some sort of, of assistance in raising funds, crowdfunding is perfect. A lot of people have used it. A lot of platform where you can go to, to, to start kickers, start kickers, I think it's called kicker start or kicker starter, Indiegogo, and there are so many, so many others. Those, those are where you can, a lot of people are willing to invest in maybe an idea that they like, they provide the funds that you need, and you don't have to repay that. It's not a debt, you don't have to repay it. You know, just give them a, a, a gift, a shirt or whatever. And in, another option, very similar to this, is peer-to-peer -peer lending, where very much like crowdfunding, people are willing to invest and give you the money that you need, but unlike crowdfunding, you have to repay that debt. Within one to five years, you have to repay with interest rate. I would even consider micro-lending. Micro-lending, if you're looking for a small amount of money, your, your, your credit score is not so high, SBA provides assistance to a lot of micro lenders in the marketplace. The Leaf Fund used to be called Action, BCL of Texas, People Fund, $50,000 or less, especially if you're a veteran, it's 5% interest rate for the life of the loan, so that's not bad at all. And the last option would be equity financing. You know, those of you who watch Shark, Shark Tank, you see it every week and uh, venture capitalist firms do the same. SBA has a similar program where we can, you know, we can take equity in your business. You don't have to repay if I go under. So that's always another option to consider. 
if you are willing to be part of your business. Apple started that way, Intel started that way, Costco started that way, Federal Express started that way. So there are a lot of companies that are now, now very large that were small like you at some stage in their life who started using that option. I wish we could just create a cheat sheet after what you said, right? <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> So you mentioned um, different <coughs> options, and Nicole, when we were talking earlier, you actually have had a journey and, and maybe touched a few of those options. I think we've touched all of them. Yes. <laughs> would, you mind, would you mind sharing a little about your journey and how you might have utilized you know, some of the things that, um, like from bootstrap to, to credit card to yeah. business loan? It's, it's been an interesting journey. I think we've done it two different ways. Our two biggest businesses that stick out, in, in 2008 I mentioned we, um, Bought a family, we bought a flower shop. We knew nothing about flowers. Saw a sale sign. It was something I had thought would be a great family business. Oh, it'd be, it's over this romantic idea of how much fun it would be. And I forgot about Valentine's Day. So we get, we buy this flower shop. Um, my husband and I and a partner each put money on credit cards to pay for this, the purchase of the business. Um, at that point, we went to a local community bank and had no success getting a line of credit, a business credit card, so we were, that was bootstrapping at its extreme. Um, we turned the business around. Um, a year later, we um, had the opportunity to move into a different space. That space had two front doors. We were right on a downtown square in Carrollton, and a friend of ours was working for a, a candy distributor. He's like, you're on Main Street, you're down on the square, you know, there should be a candy store down there. Why don't you put candy in there? So when we moved, we had two front doors and half of the store became a candy store and the other half with the other front door was the flower shop. It took on, it took hold, people really liked the idea, so we had the opportunity to move one more time and in that move, we um, moved into a space that was right directly in the center of the block on Main Street and it became a full-on candy store. In the background, we had bought, a year after the initial investment, we bought another flower shop um, a little bit north of us. And when we made that move, we moved the flowers to the other location. So through this period of time, this was all based on every dime that we got out of that business went back into it in order to give us the funding to purchase another business, make, continue to make improvements, invest in buying candy into the, in, in, in that new business. Um, at this point, we're like two and a half years in, um, we had the opportunity to buy the building that our, our store was in. So it was actually two units. So at that point, we went to Chase and were able to get funding for, um, I think that's when we opened a business, we moved all our business accounts from the community bank we were in because we weren't getting anywhere with them. As far as we thought, we thought for sure, because it was a community bank, they would be more willing to lend to us because we were a local business, we were right in their backyard. And that, that was not the case at all. Um, so at that point, we contacted Chase. We were able to secure a mortgage for the building based on our track record um, and the business growth that we've seen. Um, and we were able to purchase the building. Now we had income coming in from um, one of the, the spaces that we were renting out. Um, ended up selling the flower shop. Several years later, um, we decided that, okay, we want to open another store because we didn't have enough going on. <laughs> we wanted to, actually wanted to be in Dallas proper was the goal. Um, and at that point, we had been with Chase for a while. They had been very good to us. We were able to get business credit cards, um, a line of credit for our existing business that allowed us to do capital improvements. Um, we were able to redo the flooring and you know just continue to, again, put every dime that we made back into those businesses to keep fostering the growth because at this point, um, both my husband and I and my partner have all maintained full-time jobs. So it was two, yeah, two years ago, um, we had been talking about doing another business, which was Nikki's, um, and we were at the point where my husband and I were going back and forth, okay, who's going to quit their job? Because we're now taking on something that's so big that somebody's going to have to quit and manage this. And I was fortunate enough to, everyone in my company was offered a um, voluntary severance. So it was kind of like, okay, that made the decision for us. It was like, it's my turn. I get to, <laughs> I get to throw all my, my dress shoes and my dress clothes away. And we, took, we started this adventure. And that's when we approached Chase about um, funding an SBA loan. And um, we were able to, it wasn't, I'm not going to say it was an easy process, um, but it was based on our banker. Our banker was extremely helpful and guided us through. It was a, a tremendous amount of paperwork. and all of that stuff, but the bank has been extreme, Chase has been great to us. 
So you had you utilized many of the methods that Herb spoke <laughs> about, right, and, and through your journey. Um, another question for you, and then I'd love to open it up to the rest of the panel to see if they have anything to add to this great story. How did you decide what loan when? Did you, was that, was it just intuition? Was it speaking with others? I mean, when did you decide to use, you know, regular business loan versus the SBA versus your credit card? Um, I think it was, I think it was just kind of, I think we knew enough about business finance. I'm an, I was an analyst, a business analyst, so I, can, I have some business sense already based on my personal experience, but it really depended on what we were trying to do. Obviously, credit cards will get us a little bit extra inventory leading into Valentine's Day because we know we're going to have that cash back before we get the you know the giant bill from the supplier. Um, it was I guess maybe it's more based on scale. When we had to do capital improvements and in, and move one location to the other, we needed a little bit more money than we were comfortable putting on a credit card, and that's when we thought you know it would be just nice to have that cushion, yep. so that if something does come up, we're not in a panic trying to. It's just nice having that safeguard. So maybe cash flow and scale were some of the differentiators. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know, Hayden, Frank, Shelley, would you add anything as you think about types of credit yeah, options? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, if, if I'm speaking to uh, you know more of the entrepreneurial set, the the feedback that we often get the most is, look, I'm looking for non-dilutive capital. I've started off this business, and I want to own 100% of the pie, and we absolutely understand that and get that. Uh, but in some cases, it does make sense um, to own maybe 80% of a much larger pie than 100% of one that will be much smaller. And again, these depend on circumstances and what you're looking for out of that capital. Uh, because in some cases, if you're looking just for a loan to buy a machine or a piece of equipment or whatever the case may be, not sure if equity is the best is the best solution for something there. But if you're looking more for um, in addition to the dollars that would come from somebody like that, but uh, an experienced mentor, smart money, as, as we call it, then that's when it probably makes more sense to look at some form of, of dilutive capital. What's that percentage? It really is a case-by-case -case scenario, depending upon what your growth ambitions are and what the capital needs are. Um, so in some cases, it, it would make sense, but... Uh, in other cases, that's not necessarily the case because, as was mentioned earlier, there are a growing number of alternatives for, for financing. Uh, you know, banks are, are, of course, a, a wonderful solution that have you know, a broad range of capabilities, but in some cases, uh, the, the risk parameters around a certain business are such that it might not make sense for either party, and that's okay. Uh, as we always like to say within J.P. Morgan Chase, it's our job to deliver a solution. Um, ideally, that solution is branded J.P. Morgan Chase, but if it's not, still deliver a solution, and it's our goal to introduce those alternative resources uh, when it makes sense. So, uh, in, in many cases, for uh, you know growth-oriented companies, there's this notion of royalty-based financing. It's 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 not uh, one that requires a trade of equity, but it really is there to support growth and is repaid as companies continue to grow. So. Um, fortunately, there, there are a number of alternatives that are available, um, debt financing being the least expensive in most cases uh, because that cost of giving up equity, you really don't appreciate it until the back end when there's, you know, hopefully a successful exit on the back, on the back side. So you, you all actually spoke about banks quite a bit. Um, I'd like to round robin this. Shelly, I'll start with you and then we'll come down. Um, what opportunities are there for entrepreneurs to access business products outside of a bank? Uh, so, as far as uh, that goes, I mean, there's lots of different ways to access that. Um, you can, what, if you have a family friend who's willing to invest, by con connections that way, venture capitalists, um, lots of different ways to do that. Um, the Treehouse is a really good resource for that. If you ever are uh, not necessarily knowing uh, which direction you want to go in, go meet with the mentors. Go meet with those people who can tell you, oh, this is what you need and this is who you should meet with, and um, they'll, they'll help you gain those resources and gain that information. Do you want to add anything, or Hayden? Yeah, so uh, I'll jump in just kind of briefly here. So outside of banks, as I mentioned, there's a lot of other resources, especially as we see with the evolution of technology, right, with mobile payment technologies that are coming up, um, crowdfunding, as was mentioned a little bit earlier. There's a number of different alternatives that are available. Um, but uh, we mentioned 
we've gone everything down the capital stack, as we like to call it. There's the trade finance, the trade terms that you get. In some cases, um, vendors are willing to take a slice of equity to the extent you have to extend it in exchange for either discounted terms or, or doing some type of pro bono work. Um, you know, there's, there's senior secured and unsecured financing that's available, mezzanine financing for later stage companies and, uh, and the various forms of equity that are, that are open. Well, it's, it's very rare for a business to find success by going alone. I mean, you don't really hear, I mean, you hear bootstrapping related to kind of financial bootstrapping, but I like to apply it to any exterior resource that you're bringing in. So for somebody to join an incubator or a startup to go to SBA's resources of the small business development centers to work on their business plan before they get in front of a bank, you're getting ex exterior resources that you didn't have prior to you. And you're, you're now showing that you're not just locked into a bootstrapping mindset. So that mindset shift of getting somebody else involved with your business, I mean, allows you to build relationships outside of just a bank, but a bank could be a mentor and not even give you money. Uh, I mean, those bankers are, are gonna be around there, but anybody or anything that you bring outside of your business that you didn't have beforehand shifts you outside of bootstrapping. So you actually are taking bootstrapping to a whole new level. It's not just about dollars. It's almost like intellectual um, capital. It's knowledge about um, running your business and probably just in general resources to help you be um, successful along the way. Absolutely. So. I mean, especially if you're putting dollars into it. I mean, if you're paying for a program to learn new skills, I mean, that's you investing in yourself and your business, and it's going to lend you to get to that stage. I mean, tapping into your family and friends and getting all that seed round done, but then showing that you have the track record to grow and, and want to grow and scale, it's, it's, a, it's almost a mindset and personality type for that drive. So Nicole and Herb, in your opinion, is there a downside to bootstrapping? You want me to go first? <laughs> I look at our, our history as two separate growth cycles. The first time it was very much by the, everything was done by the string of a thread or however you want to say that, where every, we were just using every available penny and nickel and dime to get things done and we did it part time outside of working a full time job. And the second time around when we built Nikki's, it was very different because we had the support of an SBA loan. We had undivided attention because I left my, my job and I was focused 100%. And the amount of growth that occurred in the first four years of our experience versus the amount of growth that we've had in the last year and a half are completely different because we've had the finances and the focus and the intention. So we boots, we've always bootstrapped, but the growth is so much more tremendous when you have more resources available to you and focus. Herb, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, judging on, on Nico's model seems yes. as though it, 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 it does work. And obviously my, my way of thinking is you really cannot grow the business fast enough just using your own limited funds. So at some point, one has to do what Nicola's done, and that's why I like her model, is to start that way with, with no credit, and as the business, you know, more business coming in, there is that need to go to a bank and wherever to get more money to inject into the business. So I'm gonna take a few moments and open it up to the audience to see if you have any questions. Oh, we do, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of touch on kind of the board member piece. Whether it's a for-profit and not-for-profit, an early stage or a later stage company, that is something that, that banks look at um, to kind of assess, if you will, kind of the strength of that board and kind of what they're able to offer to the company. Uh, because in some cases, that bank may have a relationship with board members already and can provide some insight as to, okay, tell us what's really happening within the board meetings. Uh, what strategic direction are we going? And we kind of cross that with maybe our day-to-day -day discussions with the company. So um, again, that, that's something that we, that we take a look at. And in terms of credit scores for not-for-profits, uh, 
got to admit, I've never worked really with not-for-profits, uh, but a financial analysis is conducted. It may not be a traditional FICO score, and I've, I've got to admit, I, I don't have experience in that, in that arena, um, but that analysis is done very similar to a for-profit company. Understanding what the charter and the mandate is for a not-for-profit, it's not necessarily to throw off 35% EBITDA margins the way maybe a growing software company is, um, but to see how that cash or any form of capital that is raised historically, whether it be through donations, contributions, how that's used and compare that to kind of what a plan is. Because very often a, a, a bank or any investor will want to take a look at a 24, 36 month plan and then compare actual results to that and make decisions at that point. Yeah, nonprofits can be run very, very similar to a business um, in that sense of building that credit history. It's, it's really that history. It's showing what you're able to do with the money that's coming in and where it goes and how it's tracked. I mean, there's, there's so much more impact on a nonprofit as far as tracking and stuff like that. But for like S-Corps and, and limited liability corporations, those, those owners are going to have an equity play in it. So it's, a, it's a, an added layer as far as the evaluation of that, those board members. Yeah, I believe so. I believe you can get a Duns and Bradstreet number and really check that. But I mean, it comes down to like, what are you able to, to are your suppliers reporting information about your payment history um, that's going to lend it, or is it just getting evaluated by a business credit card that you have for the nonprofit or a debit card that you're using through the bank that you work with? And I mean, that checking account is what starts to track that stuff. Great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Herb did a really great job of decision treating the access to capital, but um, can you guys speak a little bit about to the documentation uh, that's required uh, so that the small business owner can then go to the marketplace for them? As it relates to SBA loans? Just to the whole um, universe. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you did such a great job of talking about the platform, yep. but for a small business owner to start to look at that, he or she is going to need to put sure. some documentation together. So not necessarily to each one, but from a sure. level. Kind of a macro level. Yeah. Sure, certainly. So a, a financial package, for lack of better words, is really helpful. It's a good starting point. What is a financial package? It can vary, right? In, in some cases, if a company has been established for a couple of three years, then uh, any type of external or even internal prepared financial statements um, going back two, three years, uh, along with a projected budget to show what the capital need is going to be going forward and what the earnings expectations are. And then also an, an attempt to model, because we understand entrepreneurs aren't necessarily in the business of building financial models, uh, but how any type of requested debt would get repaid over some period of time and how that looks like and the ability of the company to service all of its obligations, not necessarily the repayment of debt, but its other obligations to maintain its business, its ongoing capital expenditures, um, its taxes, uh, th things like that. So that that's helpful and then personally what I like to see, I like to see a company able to identify the market that it's gonna go after, right? So kind of start off broad. I'm gonna solve a business problem and here's my addressable market. And of that addressable market, I'm not going to try and conquer all of it in the next 24 months. I'm going to go after a slice of it, and this is the way I'm going to do it, and this is the way my mousetrap is better than anybody else's. So a good business plan in addition to a financial plan is always a really good start. In addition to that, as you, as you will find, an underwriting process of any sort, whether it's equity or debt, it's an iterative process because in some cases it starts off with simply financial statements and then it goes a little bit deeper in terms of review of customer contracts. It goes into review of any type of um, stock repurchase agreements, things like that. Nicole, did you have any best practices to share when, just, you, went, when you were looking for the... It was just a lot. They asked for a lot of information. So being, getting it, getting it to keeping, really keeping organized, keeping your financial, your personal finances separate from your business finances is key, because you want to be able to present them. Here's a clean package. This is what this is, and it's not muddied with this. You know, here's where I stand personally. Here's where my business stands. And that we've just, we've always done, taken a very um, stringent approach to accounting. So. 
personal expenses from business, having a really good business plan, and also a financial package. Even if it's early on, have Absolutely. it contain projections, um, and based on, and also a potential debt repayment. That's right. Okay. I always like to I say, heard. you don't have to be the one entering in the data, but you need to right. be the one that can tell the story of what those numbers say. Mm -hmm. Great. We have, we another, have another oh, question over here. Yes. Sure. Certainly, equity contribution is always the, you know, the the place where everything starts, right? We every financial institution wants to see that an operator has some skin in the game, um, whether that's a, a small entrepreneur to the much larger equity investors, the likes of Vista and KKR, among others, that there is some type of financial interest at stake. Is it a beginning of a conversation around uh, compounding that? It, it, if I understand your question correctly. Absolutely. Um, we also want to see, in addition to that, that there is a track record of the business, right? Um, and that it's uh, defendable and uh, it, it's able to you know, withstand some type of competitive forces and it has the ability to repay um, that debt over some reasonable period of time. Great. We have a question in the back there. Oh, you have two. So, gentlemen, yes. So how do you quantify your intellectual capital versus other? Any? I guess Frank, it's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we use a couple different alternatives, right, in terms of kind of using discounted cash flow analysis around a company and kind of go into external experts, quite honestly. We, we touch base with operating partners of, of others because, look, we're not technologists by trade. Right, we're, we're not, and we're first to admit that. Um, but but we do know how to go in and diligence a company and identify, you know, what might some of those gaps be? Uh, what are some of the macro factors that could change for a company uh, that could disrupt it? Now, can you apply leverage and can you attract capital based on amount of that intellectual capital? Absolutely, you can. Uh, is it going to be senior secured bank debt? Probably not if there's not an earnings history behind it. Um, but but uh, we, we just we, we take a look. In some cases, we'll hire ex, um, subject matter experts, if you will, to take a look at underlying code, uh, because we've been in some instances where uh, we'll be in the depths of, of an analysis and they say, okay, here, take a look at our code. Again, I'm not a technologist, so I'm not going <laughs> to kind of deconstruct that and say, yes, that's worth $100 million, but we do hire people um, that can do that for us and be sure it's defendable. So before we take another question, so Shelley or Hayden or Herb, Herb, like Frank's used a lot of terminology, Nikki and her experience. Not everybody might understand some of the, techno the Sorry, terminology you use. Sorry, I fall into banker used. talk sometimes. Oh. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's actually, it probably depends on where you are in your journey. And so if people do have questions, are there places that they can go to learn the basic financial terminology, what it looks like to have a basic financial package or business plan? Absolutely. Uh, there are lots of programs out there, uh, a lot of people who volunteer their time that want to meet with people in the startup community to help you and assist you and help you uh, make those decisions and teach you what's, what this means and what this, uh, that means and explain to you the differences between all these options and uh, there, there are lots of people out there um, and if anyone would like to connect with me afterwards I would be happy to share more information about uh, connecting you with those people. Um, there are a lot of programs uh, throughout the Dallas Metroplex that, that are willing to help. Yeah. If I can follow on, and this is just kind of a general observation, you know, there are a lot of mentors that, that want to help up and coming companies because in many cases 
These folks have made their bones already, and they're concerned about legacy and kind of passing it forward. Um, so just be vocal. Just reach out to people, um, people that have had success in scaling companies, people that maybe had a couple of business failures, kind of teach you what not to do in some cases. So there's just a, a range of people that are out there that are, that, are, that are willing, and very often it's part of networking in groups like this with Startup Week where people are really interested in, in uh, helping you know, emerging companies continue that growth. So. How about you, Herb? I was going to add that uh, the percentage of, of business startup that fail is just amazing. The number is so huge that I hate to mention it at conferences. But nevertheless, I think there is so much out there when businesses fail, it is because of lack of management experience and expertise, not, not really for money. And there is so much out there that the small business community can take advantage of, but they don't. Like within the SBA toolbox alone, we have mentors, people who can help you get started and stay with you throughout, throughout your growth. We have a group called SCORE, former business owners, all retired. Uh, no, 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 their vested interest is to help you be successful. Small business development centers funded by the SBA, you find them everywhere. 900 centers throughout the United States, 18 in my district office where one can go and say, I need help. I'm looking for financing, and I heard the word business plan quite often. I don't know what it looks like. Even though I have a PhD, I don't know how to write one. Those guys will assist you in putting it together, and if you start a company, help you with the cash flow projection, prepare the entire package for you that, by the way, banks love to see coming from the SBDC. So there is a lot of there. I'm amazed at, at the emergence of accelerators. And you go there and you have so much assistance and it may not be free of charge, but certainly it's not too expensive either. So with the small business owners, you really need to take advantage of everything that is available to you as taxpayers. Absolutely, SBDCs are a great resource. The first business I started, we raised the family and friends stuff, we then went to the SBDC just to fine tune the, the finances and get preps because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Herb, the SBDC has really got a good pulse with a lot of the financial institutions, knowing who is looking maybe for what, and so when you get prepped and you're ready to approach, it's getting prepped and going to them. Um, but kind of touching on how Frank had, had talked about mentors, it's amazing what you'll see in the uh, startup community across the region. There's a lot of people with the give before you get mentality. So they're wanting to create value for you before ever expecting something to come in return because that creates value for them just knowing that they're helping somebody um, that is needing just some answers to questions that they have that keeps them up at night. Great, so I know we had a question on the left and then what I'm going to do, take your question, is we'll actually you know, continue this on across the hall and you'll be able to answer, um, ask any questions directly to our panelists. So the gentleman in the yellow shirt. Sure. Uh, so this is for Nicole and everybody else. So what other role did, talk about mentors, but what other role did other professionals play in helping you with financing attorney, insurance agent, CPA? So, um, we have a very strong CPA whose husband is our corporate attorney. So we've always, I guess coming from a corporate background, we always knew it was important to, to pay the right people to give you the, that good advice. In the in the this get the subject matter experts, I know how to do to run operations, be efficient, and manage my costs. My husband is very creative, and we're missing a lot of those other details. So we we've learned. Fortunately, we haven't had any major disasters or anything, but we've learned to pay the professionals to do those those things where it could you have a lot of risk. It's like puzzle pieces. Figure out what you have, <laughs> what all of your family, friends have, and then you know where you actually really need to fill it in. So um, before we go head across the way for um, our reception, I did want to, first of all, thank our panelists for an incredible, <laughs> incredible um, wealth of information. And um, if you could all, I want, would love for you to leave um, our audience with one piece of advice, whether it's business credit, a business product, like cards, like loans, uh, in one final sentence, what would you say 
let's keep it Twitter-like, you know, the 144 characters. <laughs> Shelly, can I put you on the spot first? Sure. <laughs> Uh, my advice is to use the resources and make sure that you're using the right resources to give you the correct information. I, I would say that look, it, it's okay to know and admit what you don't know. Nobody's going to fault or question that, and if anything, people will applaud that. It takes a certain amount of kind of emotional maturity to acknowledge that, and it's kind of hard with a type A entrepreneur to acknowledge there may be something that I don't know, but it's okay, and, and reach, out to, uh, reach out to professionals that have experience in that. Great. Mine would have to be don't make decisions based on assumptions. If you feel it is assumption, validate it, research, get connected to people that know a little bit more about that before um, just assuming that somebody won't work with you because of the stage you're at. Mine would be keep your day job as long as you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> Walking away from that income is very, it's a very hard decision to make. It does free you up to, to spend more time focused on the business, but having that and really roughing it as much as you can is the best advice that I could give. SBA.gov. <laughs> <laughs> It has everything. Yeah. <laughs> yes. it has, it's all there. Whether it's the capacity building, the training that you may need, whether it's the lending that you may need, micro lending up to venture capitalist lending, if it is uh, doing business with the US government, it's all there. The grants program to the SBIR program, which is free money, it's all available. Grants.gov, which is part of SBA, any grants in the government, it's, it's listed right on our website. So I think those were some very insightful last thoughts. And we want to invite you um, right across the hall. You, we were, um, we're hosting a reception from 5 to 7 where our panelists will be there that you can ask any questions or get some more of their insights. And um, also, as a thank you for attending this panel, did everybody get their notebook from Chase, Inc.? If you did not, there are some notebooks out front. Um, Chase, Inc. is our business credit card. And you have Chase, Inc. notebooks to help capture all the fabulous information that you got this evening and the rest of the week. And thank you all very, very much for your time and enjoy the reception.